Hi! Welcome to Chapter 7 of Radical Acceptance by, excuse me, Tara Brock. So, in Chapter 7, Tara is talking about opening our heart in the face of fear. So this is a big chapter. It's one of her longer chapters. Um, and it's really important that you don't start on this one. So if you have not read it or watched my other videos, you should either read or watch the video summaries um, because this is a big one. Um, she talks about fear and I think all of you ultimately know that fear is what occurs when we feel overwhelmed or powerless, paralyzed. Um, oftentimes it brings up uh, all sorts of anxieties. Um, it's the lack of love. It makes us feel like we are unacceptable. It makes us feel less competent. Um, and really, so I'm looking at all my notes if everyone's wondering why I'm looking down. Fear is really the anticipation of future pain is what she says and I thought that was really interesting again it as a neuroscience geek uh, I will tell you that the idea of that really leads to anxiety right because anxiety is when you're focused on the future um, and fear then is linked to that um, it can also be a trigger, right? So oftentimes our fears um, end up with a amygdala hijack. And when that happens, if, if any of you have heard me talk about children, I talk about this a lot. Once the amygdala takes over and it's triggered, you only respond with FFF, right? So... Fear equals fight, flee, or freeze. Um, it's really easy to see this in children. They are great examples of it, but guess what? It happens in adults too. Just so you know, fighting can be verbally fighting. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily throwing a punch at you, or the, it, although it can mean that. And really, she goes on to talk about how this response, this FFF fear response, really is linked to childhood and memories and things that have occurred to us. Um, what else did she talk about? She, she said the emotions of fear are usually threats to our well-being. And when we're experiencing that emotion of fear, our brain is actually focused on perceived threats. It doesn't actually have to be real threats, which is really key when you're learning the neuroscience and psycho, um, I was gonna say psychobiology, but psychology as well. Um, basically, if your brain perceives something as a threat to your well being, that can be physically, that can be emotionally that can be mentally, that even can be spiritually. And if that happens, your brain will automatically try to protect itself. The amygdala will take over because that's what it's supposed to do. That flips on our parasympathetic nervous system. She doesn't talk about this, but this is the gen uh, synopsis, right? And you go into FFF. All right, so she talks about how we then are bound into that reactivity um, and this can lead so she says it stems usually from our experiences in the past oftentimes it's childhood that's how far back um, fears are coming from sometimes you remember the reason that you have those fears sometimes you don't but it's usually something that happens in childhood repeatedly it's not it can be a one time traumatic event but usually it's not usually it's a repeated thing that happens over and over and your mind builds up this kind of 
pattern, this story and this fear, and we hold that into adulthood and it becomes triggers for us. And that's when we go into this like fear patterning. Now this reactivity, she even talks about being embodied. And one of my clients had asked that I talk about embodiment so that once I finished with radical acceptance, I'll do um, a live on embodiment, like what that means and how we do that. But Tara talks about the fact that when you hold these fears for a long time, because they're coming usually from childhood, that it can lead to habitual tightness. Um, so if you're doing yoga or even if you're doing, hi, um, meditation, oftentimes you can feel tightness and sh if you've done these challenges that I have put forth to you every week um, oftentimes she does body scans or body scans are part of that and you will notice when you do mindful meditation good morning Alyssa and all of the your family if they're around if you do mindful um, meditations they usually um, have part of this body scan and they will tell you you're not do anything about the tightness or the weird things that you feel but become aware of them and I think part of that awareness is what she's talking about here is that usually when you have fear long-term fear built from childhood experiences we tend to embody them in certain places a lot of times that's neck shoulders you, you feel tightness in there. Sometimes it's chest. You feel tightness, especially if you've been triggered recently. Stomach stuff um, all tend to come from that. Um, she then goes on to talk about how when our brain forms these stories, right, from these events that have occurred, the result of the fear is usually some blame and it's oddly, or I guess not oddly, I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense that we're gonna blame someone for those things. Either we're gonna blame others or we're gonna blame ourselves. Others are always doing this, this, and this, or it's because I'm always doing this. And she talks a lot about that when she talks in those beginning cha chapters about the trance, um, that kind of blaming. Um, she talks about this is really that same cycle that we've talked about before of shame and fear, how they kind of reconnect to each other. And she then goes on to talk about people and our connection to people because how they affect our fear, right? They could either increase our fear or decrease our fear depending on how we're interacting with them or our relationship with them. And she also goes on to talk about how you know that you're in the cycle of fear reaction, oftentimes because the proportion of your reaction is not um, logical, all right? So it's out of proportion. What happens from that is that feeling of safety has gone away. Um, this is not something that you're consciously controlling, right? But when your brain perceives again that it's unsafe and there's a threat, right? Again, it could be emotional threat. It does not have to be physical threat. It wants to protect itself. Like that's what your brain does. It's going to protect itself. Um, and because because this cycle is stemmed from past experiences, it is not like I can go in and fix that problem, right, by meeting a, a need. So oftentimes in kids, they haven't yet formed this huge fear reactivity cycle, but they still have perceived threats and oftentimes they cannot regulate themselves and I talk a lot about co-regulation where I can meet a basic need, hunger, sleep, right? Sickness, I can comfort them and that helps. With adults, that's not the case. And we, at this point, find ourselves feeling really alone. We feel powerless. 
we feel terrified, we want to hide. A lot of times we want to hide our fear. We don't want to show it to other people. All of those things increase the fear. So it is like this terrible, terrible cycle of fear and feeling back into that trance, right, of unworthiness, shame, guilt. So how do we get out of it? She's good in this chapter. She brings together some of the things she's been talking about. She first highlights the first step to get out of this fear, right, to open your heart in the face of fear is connectedness to others. My hippie heart can't be happier when she says this. She talks about how you need to use mindfulness to be aware of your inner thoughts and what's really going on. Um, I think that's the first step in recognizing that it's fear or recognizing that your reactions are not in proportion to what is going on and that there's something deeper. So again, that awareness, which I have said since the very beginning is your first go-to, become aware, dig in what is really going on. And don't be afraid to call yourself because sometimes we build up a pattern of, I know that I'm overreacting and then we go into our story and we don't dig deeper. We don't keep probing ourselves, um, which is the beginning of awareness. We see that it's there, but we're not digging deep enough. So don't be afraid to call yourself on it. But the one thing that she talks about in this connectedness step is that you don't want to do it alone. I love this. Well, A, I'm a coach. And why does coaching help? She talks about the support of a person, even a close friend that you can actually have a support system with, not, you know, that you're, you want to be careful about codependency and all of those things and asking things you can't, but knowing that you need to lean on somebody else for support is the first step. So what it does is when you have a support person and and I'm, I'm going to say she talks about therapy and she talks about her own role. I don't think she's a f full therapist. I don't know what, I'm, I take that back. I don't know what she is, so I don't want to say something that's incorrect. But when I think of reaching out for support, you know, therapists are a great thing. Um, you can even uh, look at coaches or any so sort of support system that is there for you to connect with. And this is what she says. It literally makes us feel safe enough to open the door just a little bit to what that fear is inside. And I think this is so important because I do believe in mindfulness meditation and I think you can do a lot on your own, but sometimes and you just need the support of someone else and it doesn't have to be support and like giving you 20,000 tools even. Sometimes it's just the support knowing this person is there solely for me and that connection is safe. There's not judgment and it allows you to kind of lean in because you can't do it all on your own and I'm just leaning in enough to open the door to the fear, to finding out what's really underneath and I will say I have a coach and I couldn't even begin to do some of the deep work that I've done without her. So that's my, I guess, plug on finding a great support system. The second thing she talks about is refuge. Now, Buddhism is big into refuge, like finding these refuges. In fact, they have a whole meditation that's talked about the refuge and sometimes you'll see this referred to as finding the refuge in the three jewels. She doesn't talk about that at all, but I've seen this um, because I like Buddhism. And oh, thanks Katie. Um, I think having a great coach is really important, right? Like sometimes that that can just open up the door to all of the stuff. And sometimes it's not even about groundbreaking stuff. Like I said, sometimes it's just that connectedness allows you to have the door open. Um, the three jewels in Buddhism are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. 
what the heck does that mean for everyone who's not a Buddhist? Well, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Buddha is really the idea of our awakened self. So if you're, you know, starting mindfulness and you're talking about really tapping into yourself and your thing, that would be Buddha. And you can find refuge in that. Dharma is simply the path, the way, or the teachings that you're following. And Sangha is the community, the spiritual community that you have. So there's actually meditation, and she mentions it too, where in Buddhism they actually will just say, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. And they do that three times. And each time they are building in more openness to the idea, to the experience, and basically to deepen the faith and the process. Um, we trust then that with using these refuges that we are open and trusting to the unfolding of what's going to happen. Research shows that it's, it's the therapeutic relationship that connection matters. I love that, Alyssa. That's very true. I believe that. There there is a breadth of research that talks about how having a support system is integral to us growing and being able to overcome things. And it doesn't have to be um, medical, right? So it's true. Sometimes, and I think um, the book that I also want to touch on um, which is listen which is a parenting book but she talks about having a another parent that is there for you to listen and you're listening to each other to be that person that support person right that connected relationship where you're not judging so important um, PS if you have a uh, friend who you're using as your support person make sure that you're not feeling any judgment from that friend, it's really important that you feel that you can be open with them. I'm on a live, what do you need? I don't know. They spoke about that a lot in the theories class and we were looking into choosing. Yes, it's, it's very much true. So, I'm just gonna go quickly through these Oh, I love all these comments. I hope people read all these comments if they watch the playback. Um, I can't remember if they come up or if you have to swipe for them. So if you're watching the playback, swipe to see the comments. So there's some great, there's some great information in the comments by amazing people who have a lot of uh, insight. All right. So when you take refuge, refuge in the Buddha, you're really taking refuge in your own heart, all right? So it is our own being that allows us to face and overcome fear. We talked about this in the last uh, live in chapter six when the Buddha um, has that whole story of Mara where they invite, he invites them to tea where he faces the fear. And when you take refuge in that, you are opening up yourself to know that you have the strength to see this right to invite it in to really look at it and not just avoid it and number two the dharma or the path or the way is really taking refuge a deeper refuge because you're paying attention to the fears right and you're awakening to the nature of that so she actually goes and talks about, she really feels that communing with nature is um, a really effective way to take refuge in Dharma because Dharma is all around us. This, you know, connection in Buddhism uh, to the things around us that for her, that is taking refuge. And you can usually feel that. So a lot of people will say, I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to go walk the dog. I'm going to go um, hike a mountain here in New Hampshire. They do that a lot or fishing or things of that where they're reconnecting with nature would be an idea, uh, the same idea of taking refuge in Dharma. Um, and the third thing is that community. 
So taking refuge in, in others or in a community basically means you understand the support of knowing that others believe the same thing as you, that you too can continue on this path and be successful. So it brings you a little bit of hope, right? That camaraderie, that hopefulness. Um, this is when you work, when you're working with your support person and you suddenly understand that there's a feeling that other people do this too and that it's, it's effective, right? You have this way that you're shared experience creates a compassion outside of yourself. I love this idea that it's the shared experience that leads to this compassion because sometimes people have a really hard time with self-compassion and it's easier to see or develop compassion for others. Sometimes it's the opposite, but most people it's easier to provide that compassion for others and if you share the experience, it's even easier because you can literally understand why someone is feeling that way. She also calls this the invincible shield of caring. Just so, sorry, it snowed up here so my kid is going out to play in the snow so my dogs, of course, are really upset that they can't be part of that. Um, and basically, I think all of you in this day and age especially understand taking refuge in Sangha because we all do it. Why do we join certain social media groups? Like instead of just posting on our own, we feel compelled to like join these other groups that have a shared interest and then become the support system. Yes, it's beautiful. I'll show you a picture of my snow in a minute. Um, she also has a separate section in here, which I'm not going to go into a lot, but I think it's a very important point to make that medication can work with meditation and Buddhism doesn't say that you can't be medicated or you can't reach enlightenment or that there's anything wrong with using medication if you need it. So. I think that's a really good point just to bring up because I know that there are some groups that are very against medication and she made she just wanted to make a point to say listen brain chemistry body chemistry everything is different if you have a block and medication is going to help you absolutely use the medication now sometimes meditation or getting far down your awakened path can help you reduce medication or even eliminate medication, but it's not something that has to be done in the absence of it. And I think that's really beautiful, non-judgy. It would be hypocritical almost, I think, if they said you couldn't do it without, or you had to do it without. So I did love that. Um, Okay, and then she moves on and goes into awareness. So I wrote this down as like a um, progression of things that happen. And it, it again is a theme of this book, right? Like she starts with awareness and then she has a pause. She talked about the pause. And now she's talking about widening the lens during that pause, okay? And the reason why is perspective. So if you are a client of mine or you have another coach or therapist, oftentimes it's looking at things from a different perspective because we get stuck in that fear cycle, right? And we can't kind of see the other side. So she says, use the things you have developed. Use that awareness, use the pause to open and widen the lens. And then you can be open to the fear without falling into the same cycle and pattern of fear. And I think that is really the key is what we're trying to do is opening ourselves to the fear, seeing it, realizing it, and accepting it. 
We don't have to berate ourselves for the cause of the fear or berate somebody else. The fear exists. So being open to the fear doesn't mean that, you know, you're constantly judging yourself or judging someone else for creating the fear. The fear is there. We're going to be open to it and see it for what it is. And we're going to stop resisting it. And again, I cannot for the life of me let go of the idea of natural labor <laughs> in childbirth as a better example. I used to say this to people way before I got into any sort of Buddhism. They say, they used to say to me, oh my gosh, what's natural labor like? Or how do you do it? And how do you deal with it? And I would say... It reminded me of back pain. So childbirth or back pain, pick your pick your thing that you're your experience. In that you become really aware, right, from intense pain. If you tighten and try and resist that pain, it is infinitely worse. Okay? Whether it's childbirth, labor pains, whether it's back pain. The tightening up and resisting, I'm doing it in my back right now, right? The tightening up and the resisting causes so much pain that it makes everything worse. But opening up and just realizing that this too shall pass, there is impermanence, things do not stay the same forever, I recognize you pain, I am open to it, and so therefore I'm not going to resist it, right? Which means that I'm relaxing all of those places where the pain is. I can zero in on the pain. I'm well aware. Take a pause. I am open to it. I accept it for what it is, and that stops that terrible cycle. It is very empowering, but it is, and very true, to realize that it is not about resisting it or fighting it but accepting it that stops and I think that ultimately that's what she's talking about in this chapter when you're facing fear let's see what else all right I know so many I'm turning pages in my notebook of so many things so she really wants to end this on the idea of leaning in leaning into the fears, connecting it to the deeper feelings. And she has, again, some great stories. Um, one of the stories, the um, man she's talking about, when he got to this awareness of these deep fear feelings, said to himself and to the fear, how big are you, right? How big are we going to go with this? And then just be open to letting it. And when this happens, just so you know, just like in childbirth or back pain, just being open doesn't mean it's going to go away. So there is going to be a period of time, right, when you open to this, when you lean into it and let it be. It could be terrifying. It could be painful. It can be intense. It might just be uncomfortable. It might just make you feel lost for a little bit. Stay there. Stay in the present. Don't get sucked into the past cycles and stories. Don't start having anxiety about the future that it's never going to end. It's just going to happen. Stay there. When you can get there and you realize that you want to resist, but you persist on just leaning in and being open, what happens is the amazingness of coming out on the other side. Now she talks about this as true freedom, true peace comes. It's a calm idea. You could even call this love. It is hard. I'm not saying this is an easy practice. I don't think she's either. I mean, we're into chapter seven now, so this is real, right? Like this is really far down the path. However, when you accept this, when you when you have radical acceptance, you know, the kind part of you that's leaning in and doesn't 
It doesn't try to fix things. It doesn't try to pull away or resist. It doesn't do all of those built-in things that your brain does to protect itself. It doesn't worry. It's It recognizes it is triggered and instead of following through on those triggers, eating, alcohol, drugs, some of those immediate triggers, or blaming, hiding, to-do lists, any of those things, it's just staying, staying in that moment. What am I truly thinking? I am pausing, I am recognizing you, I see you, go deeper. How big is this? Is this gonna keep going? How big are you? Are you, are you, and what do I really feel? What am I really seeing? What am I really feeling in my heart? Once you get there, I will tell you from personal experience, it is hard because I keep going. It's not one time asking, and what am I feeling? It's remember last chapter and two, and this too, and I'm also feeling this too. And sometimes with the fear, it's so big that you have to open up to let all of it come. Sometimes we only do it in pieces at a time. And that's beautiful steps. And sometimes we have gone through that first step so many times that finally we're like, all right, I think there's something bigger behind that first step. I'm gonna open the door a little bit wider and now I see another little piece of the hall. So she actually goes on and her last section of this chapter is called The Gift of Fear. So basically, I mean, I don't know that I could say it any more poetically than that, but paying attention, being open, is holding the fear. It ends up loving freely and you stop fighting this fear. You stop that cycle, you stop it. Because you hold it for what it is, you see what it is, you experience that could be really dark and painful part and no longer resist and resist and resist making it worse and more entrenched in you. Um, she does a nice um, idea of thinking of this as seasons and you don't want to resist the seasons, right? Like you, you would make yourself miserable and also remembering there's this impermanence that happens. Things don't stay the same. So surrendering is the way to get to the freedom part. I just realized this whole thing sounds really wooey. So, <laughs> but I, I think that there's a reason for that, right? Because we're really deep inside inner work, inner personal growth work. So she also says that when we surrender to this, we tell ourselves that we can handle this. This is not about, and it's interesting because I have talked to people um, about addiction programs and 12 steps and some of the hard part about surrendering to a higher power. Um, a lot of people have a hard time with that. But part of surrendering to your fear, uh, I hope my, I hope that's not too glitchy. Um, surrendering to your fear basically is the confidence in yourself that you can handle this. You can handle this. You opened yourself up. You felt it. Sometimes woo does work. Oh, oh. it's true. You have to have a little bit of woo every now and again. Um, and when you can handle things, there's nothing left to resist. So then what happens? You have to create a whole new thing in yourself. I will put the last part is the challenge, which is a guided meditation that she calls facing fear with open and engaged presence. Um, I will link her guided meditation in the comments. I want to just put a trigger warning on there because she puts it in the book that if you are dealing with extreme trauma, this is not something that she would suggest that you do on your own um, because when you meditate about fear and you had a lot of trauma, 
it brings things up that can cause other issues. So if you know um, or suspect, because sometimes we don't know fully, but if you suspect that you are um, stuck in this fear pattern about a specific trauma, this is when it's important to uh, have a support person, um, whether that's a therapist, a doctor, a super trusted friend, um, because you don't want to do it alone because there's a lot we can do on our own but as she says there is times when you, the smart thing to do in the first step is to connect with someone else and have that support so I will put that in the comments I'm so excited that people joined for this live it makes it so much more exciting for me um, there are more chapters to come. I can't remember how many chapters are in this book. This was chapter seven of Radical Acceptance. If you want to follow along, um, you can do chapter eight for next week. Normally I do this on Mondays. My Monday was kind of crazy, so I pushed it to, na to Tuesday. So um, either way, I hope you all have a fabulous week. I will try and show you my winter wonder. <laughs> Oh, my dogs are all crazy. Shh, quiet, it's just me. I'll go to my window, ignore my messy house, and see if I can show this beautiful winter wonderland that just basically, will it let me turn the camera is the next question. It will not let me turn the camera. All right, can you see? I can't see what you can see. Uh, uh, uh. It's crazy. So it's not tons of snow, but it's enough that my kid is scraping it up to make it into a snowman because, you know, that's the beauty of living on a mountain. Um, oh, good. You could see it. It's just now staying. It was, I don't know, a little bit less than an inch. I have to take my um, hot tub down because my pop-up's not happy. But it stayed, so that must mean that winter is coming. I hope you all have a fantastic week. Uh, some of you I will speak to later this week, uh, and I will see you all next week.